Welcome everyone to our second annual potatoes workshop. And we have a special guest presenter this evening, Melissa Guthrie, who is our potato expert, very, very knowledgeable and very engaging presenter. So I'm excited to see her present for the second time on this topic. Um, I am Ann Graham. I work with the UC Davis Tahoe Environmental Research Center and in collaboration with Slow Food Lake Tahoe, the um, UCCE Master Gardeners of Lake Tahoe and the Tahoe Heritage Foundation. We are bringing back our second virtual series of these uh, high elevation grow your own gardening workshops. Um, we hope to be back in our demonstration gardens sometime in the coming years, but for now um, we're happy to make the most of our virtual platform since it is nice to be able to bring people together even when we're not able to be together in person. Tonight we have potatoes and we have a good lineup of other presentations coming up this spring. We'll have kale, lettuce, and chard next week. The week after that we will have beans and peas, then strawberries, tomatoes, and herbs. And with all of these remaining workshops, we do have starter plants available. And there are a few slots left for starter plants um, for this workshop. So if you did not get the chance to register to pick up starter plants with the potatoes workshop this year, we have extras. Um, and I'll explain how you can go through the, basically you just register the same way that you registered for this workshop, but you go through um, and actually select for starter plants or seed potatoes in this case. But we'll cover that more extensively later. For most Zoom uh, ease of engagement, uh, that's a weird way to say that, but just wanted to quickly go through a few things. Some of you that have been participating may already be experts in this, but um, in the upper right hand corner, we have different ways that you can view. So if you don't want to see the other participants on our Zoom and just want to be able to focus on our speaker, Melissa, this evening, you can click that button and click speaker and change to full view. I'll also be spotlighting presenters like I'm spotlighted right now. Um, so you shouldn't have to do that too much. But just in case I'm falling asleep and forget to change it, um, you can always switch to speaker view. Additionally, We'll be using the chat function for our question and answer period at the end of Melissa's presentation. And at the bottom of your screen, you'll see that chat dialog box. And if you click on that, it'll pop up a white box like this where you can uh, type in all of your questions. And as a reminder, I'll be the one compiling those questions for our uh, presenter at the end. So if you can send those directly to me and Graham, that'd be wonderful where it says to everyone here, you should be able to click that and click and Graham alternatively. In addition, we have a new feature on Zoom this week, um, or we tried it last week and had a few hiccups with it and I'm working through um, the best way to actually use this new live transcription, um, but we want to make sure our workshops are accessible to everyone who wants to participate. So in the bottom panel of your Zoom screen as well, you have something that says live transcript and you may be seeing subtitles pop up on your screen right now. If you click the up arrow on uh, the live transcript zone at the bottom of your screen, you will see several options. Um, and if you click view full transcript, you can actually have a dialogue box pops up and will tell you who is talking um, at what time. So you can follow along in that way. If you don't want to have the subtitles, I believe you are also able to turn them off by clicking that up arrow um, and click that hide subtitle. So however you like, to view your presentation. You have lots of options in Zoom now. Um, and fortunately, they are helping us reach a wider audience. So we are gonna transition over to Melissa now so that she can start teaching us all about potatoes. She'll have some slides presentation and then she'll be actually doing a live planting demonstration for us. Um, I know some of the feedback from last year's presentations were that uh, the video playback through Zoom was not the best um, and we were very aware of that. So we are testing out this new live planting to see how that goes. So if we would love any feedback that you all have on that. Um, it was really helpful to be able to improve our workshops for this year from all the feedback that past participants gave us in the previous year. But I'm going to stop sharing my screen and remove my spotlight and turn it over to Melissa now. So whenever you are ready, Madame. 
Hi, uh, I'm Melissa and Melissa Guthrie from Master Gardeners Lake Tahoe, California, and I am very excited to be part of our collaborative high elevation gardening vegetable workshops and presenting potatoes. Um, quickly, a little bit about my background, um, extensive background in healthcare, nutrition, corneotherapy, look it up, and most importantly, vegetable uh, growing, especially potatoes and cat parenting, forgive me. Uh, that will make sense later. Um, just a little note, please submit any additional questions not covered immediately after the presentation to Tahoe Tater Talk, all one word, at gmail.com. A lot of questions will be asked afterwards, but uh, we always get a bunch of them later that it's helpful um, to, to, to find me. Here we go. All right, um, UC Master Gardeners of Lake Tahoe is the organization I'm, I'm most closely affiliated with, potatoes around the lake. Um, and there is your Latin name for potatoes. <laughs> uh, why are we growing potatoes in Tahoe? So many people ask, you can't actually grow anything in Tahoe. No, that's not true. Um, potatoes are uniquely, uniquely perfect for our high elevation and also our acidic soil, naturally acidic soil. Um, they actually don't mind the cold. Today we're snowing, so not a problem. You can plant them anywhere. Um, you can plant them in your garden, on your deck, uh, in raised beds, buckets, even I'm sure a few of you like me have um, accidentally grown them in the pantry, forgetting them. But um, then minimal care. They're super, super easy. Um, they're a sustainable crop, meaning that you can um, save them even if you forget a few and leave them in your refrigerator and grow them next year. In terms of nutrition, I mentioned that earlier, big on nutrition. Um, they're a better vegetable than any in terms of calories and protein. Um, Tahoe's are just, Tahoe potatoes just actually taste better. And my husband says that he will not eat any more potatoes other than the ones that I grow. So I'm kind of stuck with this and you are too. Um, the plants are also really, really beautiful and they attract bees. Uh, last year I had a ton of bees that were attracted to the purple, yellow and white flowers of the potato plants that we grew last year. Um, so that's a jackpot. I did mention that at the end, they're good for your skin too. We'll get there. All right, so um, so our goals and progress, why we're growing potatoes, I mentioned a little bit of that, but the goals are to encourage your home gardeners um, to grow your own food. It's really easy and we want you to try and also to find the varieties in our area that are um, that work because not all potato varieties work everywhere. So over the past couple of years, we've, we've done a bunch of different potato varieties and we're kind of mm, narrowing it down. And then also to provide support for new gardeners and and it's really fun so to provide a, a, a rewarding potato growing experience in addition to the other crops that we're uh, we're doing in our workshops this year okay last year so just to recap really quickly uh 2020 it was actually a better potato year than it was year uh, we did uh, the huckleberry, the gold nugget, and the Norland reds. The huckleberry, it was interesting, um, and, and the gold nugget did really, really well. Um, the huckleberry, we had a lot of Prince um, Irish gophers that quite enjoyed the purple ones, and those were the huckleberries. So those ones actually did get a bit of damage from, from gophers. Um, the Norland reds did really, really well, and I will get to why a little bit later uh, as we go along. This year we're doing fingerlings, um, and we decided to do this um, because, partially because of um, COVID, and uh, it was a little less expensive to have them shipped, um, which is what we had to do rather than pick them up. Uh, fingerling potatoes are little, they're a heritage variety. Um, they do have a very high yield. They're super pretty and also very tasty, um, very creamy. And we picked varieties that we thought, um, eh, you know, were easy to identify, but also uh, amusing. They have a little bit of a nutty flavor and are perfect for container growing, growing uh, which is really important in Tahoe if you don't have any area and you have a lot of critters and you need to chase the sun. So the three different varieties of fingerlings uh, were are the sort of blue and it's totally chock full of antioxidants. It's really good roasted and we're going to have that able to harvest in about 80 days, 80 plus days, give or take. 
and it has a blue interior, super pretty. And then the banana, which I, you probably all had before, but it's very, very creamy, best steamed. Um, and I like it with um, chives and olive oil. Uh, again, 80 days plus. And then the French, you've probably seen this one before, uh, but it does grow very well. And we have tried this one before. So we added that in just for insurance. Um, so it's a red exterior skin and a creamy, creamy uh, colored interior. And that one's a little bit longer at 90 days, good for breakfast, roasted or in salads, cooled. And so um, just so that we don't have just the fingerlings, we uh, have also included an early main crop um, potato, which has a little bit of history, stable like this, but also it is really good and underutilized. Um, it's called the Upstate Abundance, and it's an early main crop potato. It's very round, and it matures early in the growing season, so even though the fingerlings are little, this one's going to come up and be harvestable early. It was developed by a guy named Walter Di Jung at uh, Cornell University, and he described it as very chefy. And they almost uh, just completely threw it out because it was small. And then he took it home, and it is abundant. It's proliferous, and um, it's abundant in its production, even though it's small and. Uh, it matures early at about 75 plus days. I would guess around here, probably about 80 days, but uh, that's our main crop one. All right, just a bit of quick history. Um, <laughs> Dave, who is my potato mentor, really loves his history. So I actually feel um, compelled to include it. Um, all right, Andean origin. I think most people know that the cultivation of potatoes was Andean in origin. and goes back 10,000 years at least. Um, the Incans cultivated them and developed a freeze-dried storage technique. And I'm going to brutalize this, but Shuno, it doesn't really matter. But it did make way for your uh, modern day boxed Hungry Man potato flakes, which I found amusing. Um, and cats actually like potatoes. Never mind that. Anyways, potatoes traveled as part of the <laughs> Spanish trade. They did prevent scurvy on long, on long ship voyages and were more were better at that for their vitamin C content than most of the uh, limes and lemons that uh, expired or got rotten earlier because of their storage capacity and, and ability to stay edible. Um, and then, and that actually uh, transitions into how Europe in, in embraced them because uh, potatoes were not initially a food crop for people, more they fed them to pigs and cows and things. Uh, but as the, with the onset of widespread famine in Europe, they became something that was um, uh, newly appreciated because of the nutritional um, value and that they were easy to grow and easy to store. <laughs> okay, more quick history. Um, part going back to the famine, one of the reasons why they had a famine in Europe uh, before potatoes uh, and then after was lack of potato variety diversity, which kind of dovetails into why we keep changing varieties every year here in Tahoe because we really do want to grow know what grows well. But in terms of history, uh, a lack of diversity actually developed potato blight because they only had like three or four types. Now we have over 200. Um, and that was in the 1800s in Europe. And we will get more history, uh, wait for it. Uh, potatoes were also an integral part of the industrial revolution in the US and Britain because as people went to work, uh, more and more people started to have little home gardens in their yards and they were cheap and easily cultivated in, in backyard uh, plots as more workers had to actually go to work. So less the grow your own. Currently, potatoes are one of the most important uh, food sources and are the most consumed vegetable in the world, followed by tomatoes and oddly not kale. But, um, and I put a little note at the bottom, nutritionists will, will nutritionists do actually consider potatoes or tomatoes vegetables. I know there are fruit. So don't, don't, don't email me about that. And then in terms of locally, uh, potatoes were actually the first vegetable on record grown by pioneers in Tahoe in Glenbrook. So um, we, we need potatoes here. More history. Oh, goodness, Dave. 
<laughs> this goes back to Europe. I kind of find this funny because it did take a while for potatoes to take take hold in Europe. They were initially called the devil's apple. I'm not sure where that came from, but a, there's a reference, there's no reference in the Bible to potatoes as food. So um, they thought they were just bad. Uh, Frederick II of Prussia, he demanded that his peasants grow potatoes and he was, he was actually uh, nicknamed the potato king um, he did threaten to cut off their ears and their noses, which would probably make me grow potatoes, and I'm not going to do that to you, but um, <laughs> didn't have anything to do with religion, and um, it, it did end up being a really good thing for, for Europe, and actually potatoes in the world. Uh, and then <laughs> the more feminine side of it, I, again, referencing the, the earlier slide, the flowers are really pretty. Actually, the plants are really pretty. So if you don't even like potatoes, grow potatoes for the flowers and the, and the foliage. Um, and so she married Marie Antoinette actually wore them in her hair. Um, and that was her way of encouraging her subjects and farmers to grow potatoes and uh, to, so that they could curry favor with her. And it worked too. Okay, nutrition. This is more my comfort zone versus history. Couple fun facts here. Um, potatoes actually have more potassium, so that's heart health, uh, than a banana. Uh, you don't even actually have to eat an entire potato to get as much potassium as a banana. And then they have tons and tons of fiber, um, which is very, very bowel friendly. In this day and age with colon cancer on the rise, potatoes are a friend to your bowel. Vitamin C, like I said, uh, it was better than um, carrying uh, citrus fruits on ship voyages, which we don't normally do, but just so you know, 45% of your daily recommendation of um, vi vitamin C uh, from the FDA uh, is in a potato. Um, they also help with iron absorption for those of you who don't eat meat and who struggle to find protein and iron dense foods other than spinach potassium, or uh, sorry, potatoes actually are uh, helpful in that respect. Um, we have the fingerlings this year, and I usually in, uh, include some that have purple or red skins because of that an antioxidant um, component. And if you eat the skins, you're doubling down. And then they do have half the calorie or a quarter of the calories of a, of a slice of bread. So kind of trendy and you people that think that you don't need gluten or are gluten intolerant or trying to restrict that from your diet, be substituted in some potatoes. They also make potato flour and potato flakes can be substituted into most recipes. Um, one of the reasons that uh, potatoes are really good for, for your gut, they, uh, they ferment in your large intestine uh, and create and offer you some uh, cancer protective uh, probiotics then they're actually no fat and a medium sized potato is about 110 calories. So not bad at all. And they, the fiber then also decreases cholesterol. So if you're on a heart healthy diet, really, really good for that. Um, and then in terms of, of growing, they don't use that much water con uh, in comparison with a lot of other crops. Okay, potato crops. Worldwide produce two to four times more food per acre than any other crop and are seven times more water efficient. I know that we're very, very um, concerned with water in our area and also we don't have a lot of land to grow uh, food crops. So potatoes, that's a true or false question. <laughs> you probably already knew these, but uh, okay. So I had a kid at a school ask me, can you just eat French fries? Because I said, they're really, really good. And he said, can I just eat French fries only? And I said, no, <laughs> no. But technically, just if you wanted to know, they do contain all the amino acids uh, to build most of the proteins. And, but you would have to eat about 10 a day. He didn't think that was a problem. Um, and eventually you, you will develop uh, vitamin and mineral deficiencies because they're not complete. So, sorry. Okay, why are we growing seed potatoes or why seed potatoes versus seeds? 
Um, sea potatoes are an example of vegetative propagation. So it's just slightly different. I know it, it looks like you're, we're just giving you a potato to go home and that might not make so much sense. But um, the plants from your seed potato are actually genetic clones of the mother plant. So you get exactly the same potatoes from the seed potato that you're putting in the ground. Um, seed, seed potatoes actually have to be certified, they have to be organic, and they have to be disease free. And all they're fully grown potatoes. So they're not technically seeds and they're not technically leftover potatoes from somebody that's growing potatoes and selling them at the grocery store. Um, newer things on seed potatoes, I get this question usually every year about can I take home potatoes that from the grocery store and then put them in the ground and are those seed potatoes? No, yes, you can. They're not technically seed potatoes, but they will grow. Um, and also as the EPA has evolved, they're starting to limit um, the CPC, which is a sprouting preventative, which is what used to be very common in, in grocery store potatoes. Um, to prevent them and, and prevent them from sprouting and also prolong their shelf life in stores. That's actually down, it's almost non-existent at this point and it's illegal in Europe. So we're kind of following their lead, um, but those are not technically seed potatoes. Uh, so they may not sprout and they may also not produce as high a yield. So yes, you can do it. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, unless you know the, the place that you got the seed potatoes. And then true potato, true potato seeds, so you see the little picture to, the, to your side there, they look like little mm, tomatillos and they do have seeds in them. They are genetically different because they're pollinated from bees. So you don't exactly know what you're gonna get uh, from that plant, which is kind of fun. Um, unfortunately, in Tahoe, I have tried to grow potatoes from seed, and it's really difficult just because we have such a short growing season. And um, for the purposes of these workshops, we're really trying to find out what grows best in Tahoe so that all of you get the best experience growing potatoes. So stick with your certified organic disease-free seed potatoes that we provide or that you can get from a local um, garden store. Um, there's a couple of them in town, but... All right, seed potato care. This is kind of the important part um, because what you put in the ground, you have to make sure it's gonna grow. So a uh, little bit of terminology, sprouted, eyed, or chitted, and you can see the little arrow. Those sprouted, eyed, chitted, all the same thing. It just means that you have your potato and it's got little, it's going, to, it wants to grow. It wants to be planted, it's starting. You can see those are the little offshoots from your from your seed potato that are eventually going to become part of the potato plant, we'll get there. Um, two different ways of, of, of planting seed potatoes. You can cut them. If they're really, really big and they have like a million sprouted eyes or chits, uh, it's perfectly um, acceptable to cut them. Just make sure that you have two of those sprouts, eyes or chits um, on each of the halves. And you also do want to make sure that you dry that that area, that cut area for about 12 to 24 hours before you plant them because um, it prevents rot and it also um, kind of calluses over so that you don't um, allow any bacteria or any weird stuff in your soil to get into your potato readily. Um, last year, uh, one of our our participants, Allison, she sent me some pictures. This was a potato that she sent me and she said, can I still plant this potato? No, that's yucky. It's gone mushy and gooey and it should be discarded. You can cut out some of the little moldy bits or soft bits, but not when it starts to look like yucky, like this one. So I thought that was kind of fun. All right, now I'm just being silly. This is uh, Dave's influence, Dave Long. I'm throwing it back to you. Uh, so yes, if you cut your seed potatoes, at least two eyes, sprouts, and then you gotta wait and then store them if you're not going to plant them, especially right now this week, we had snow. If you're not gonna plant them right away, keep them in the little paper bag that came with your pack 
uh, and then or and or store them in a cool dark place until you're ready to plant them. Um, we'll go over planting, but right now, if you do plant your potatoes, this is the time to do it, either the end of this month, which is May in Tahoe, or the first couple weeks, one to two weeks in June, and then they will be ready in mm, September, early October. All right, this is my drawing of a potato plant. Just wanted to go over a little bit of, of the parts of a potato plant. Your potato plant is actually, the entire thing is a potato. Uh, but for the purposes of this, we'll just go over um, top to bottom. So flowers, really, really pretty. And they, uh, the significance of the flowers on your potato plant is that is the start of your tuber formation. So when you start to see that at the very top of your plant, um, before they bud, they are setting those tubers, which are your uh, eventually what you're going to eat, um, into formation. Um, then, like I mentioned before, some potato plants, you'll see there's the fruit, which is those little round, looks like um, a tomatillo or a gooseberry. That's where the seeds are. Not all potato plants will set those, but if you do see those, they look like little green cherry tomatoes or tomatillos. Um, just leave them be. If you are interested in growing potatoes directly from seed, save those, dry them, and use them next year and start them early. But that is what that's doing in your plant. Um, true, true seed potatoes, true potato seeds um, are varieties. And like I mentioned earlier, they're going to be different from the potato that you planted your seed potato that you planted or the mother plant because they're gonna be pollinated by bees. And if you have different varieties of potatoes, for instance, your banana and your fleur de bleu and your French, uh, you may have um, in those seed pods uh, a combination of all those, <laughs> possibly. And then you have leaves, everybody's, that's the most important part of the leaves is the photosynthesis, again, converting light uh, and CO2 into energy that travels up and down the main stem. So your main stem, that stalk in the middle of your potato plant is for storage and transport of nutrients and water for new forming potatoes. Um, then you have stolons. So it's got, the picture is not very clear, but uh, the stolons are just kind of the underground stems that form nodules and then eventually become tubers. So if you, at the end of the year, pull up your plant and see little knotty bits on your roots, those were stolons that potentially could have, if we had a longer growing season, um, produce more potatoes. And then the best part is the mother tuber. That is actually your seed potato. So when you put your seed potato into the ground when you're planting it, it contains a ton of moisture and a ton of nutrients and that, um, is what your potato plant uses to um, form the plant. Even if you don't water it, even if you don't fertilize it, it has a bunch of those nutrients in it and water to, to form that popping up nice little uh, green bit that pops out of the ground. So um, just something to note, if at the end of the year you're digging up your potatoes and you find that uh, dried out shell of a seed potato or mother tuber, you did a really good job. So, because uh, we want that, because that means that your plant got just enough nutrients and just enough water to make its 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 new new um, tubers, and it used up all that it had without having anything extra. If you find when you dig up your potatoes a mushy, icky, squishy bit that's totally disgusting. Um, <laughs> That means that you potentially maybe have given it a little bit too much water or a little bit much too much food. And so it didn't utilize all the stuff that was in its mother. It's fine. It's just something to keep in mind if you do it again, just to, to you, you, you maybe give it a little too much water or a little bit too much fertilizer, totally fine. And then um, tubers, that's what you want after all this. Then remember that they are storage for the plant. So when your plant starts to die back, it actually reverts all the energy from its green leaves and flowers and above ground uh, foliage down into the potato tubers, which is what you want to dig up. Um, so uh, those are the storage containers. So we'll get to how to know when to harvest. And that's very important because of that up and down um, moving of nutrients 
aspect. All right. And then roots. Roots are all the way at the bottom. Just a little bit. I, it was hard to describe last year, so I, I kind of uh, have a picture for you. Um, starting left to right, you see that your seed potato either cut or whole. And then once you've planted it, you'll see that little, little bit of green. And then as it goes, it'll start to form roots and then uh, stolons and then eventually tubers. Um, potato plants grow, they're shallow root plants and they grow vertically and up, which is why we hill them. But keeping in mind, if you once you are digging and harvesting, if you find your mother plant, you kind of can find out where your potatoes are gonna be because they're not gonna be a lot much deeper and uh, they may be, uh, higher or vertical, but not that much deeper. So going through the, the stages you see is your seed potato uh, sprouting above ground, just that little bit that buds up. And that's usually I don't know, a couple weeks later. And then the hilling period is usually at least four weeks, four weeks, six weeks. And I put little red lines there just to, to kind of guide you where you're gonna hill. Unless there's a heavy frost later on, you don't want to cover the entire plant. If you are, like today, uh, having a heavy, heavy frost, it's okay to cover the entire plant. That's kind of insurance on your plant. But just make sure that you dust off that dirt afterwards um, as it keeps growing through its cycle because you don't want to keep it completely submerged in the dirt because that's how it gets its nutrients and chlorophyll and uh, that transport system. Um, so I think we're at three. So yeah, at three is about hilling up. And that's when your plant gets to about eight inches. And then you're going to continue to hill every three to four weeks until roughly it's 18 inches tall, or it starts flowering. Because when it starts flowering, that's when your potatoes are forming. Um, and it depends on whether you're planting out in the, in the garden or in your containers. Then um, next is six. That's where you see your bright purple, yellow, or white flowers. Um, and that's when your first tubers are officially, officially forming. And then you go on to tuber bulking. And then your plant, the top of your plant will die because again, like I said, it's concentrating all of its energy, all its nutrients back into the storage, which are the potatoes, the edible part of the plant. Okay, a little bit about water. Um, I've mentioned this before. They are shallow root plants. Um, again, they grow vertical and upward with hilling. And they get 50% of their water in just the top 12 inches of soil. So just keep that in mind when you're watering. They do not like to be soggy. And then, the, and then going down from there, they do, if they do not have enough water, will seek water and grow deeper. So when you're harvesting, it's something to keep in mind. 25% of their water from the second 12 feet, so two feet down. And then I've never seen potato roots in Tahoe go uh, deeper than two feet, but they can go in other other areas down as far as a yard if they are water seeking. So just remember with watering, deep, even, taper, stop. Watering, okay. Another picture just to kind of get an idea. Again, my, <laughs> I'm gonna say this a bunch, deep, even, even, taper, stop. Uh, initially, when you um, plant your seed potatoes, you want to deep, deep water them. Again, not soggy, but moist. And moist even below where you point, you're planting your seed potato. And then you want to continue through the growing cycle to just about when they've, the flowers on the plant have dropped off. And you can see that's uh, even, even flowering. You want to start to taper because really what you're wanting to do is you want to encourage that potato plant to concentrate down. And you don't want it to be soggy because if your soil is really, really soggy around your new um, tubers, uh, you risk rot. Not a huge problem here, but it's an easy way of, of, um, of monitoring your water, even, even, even through that growing. And then towards the end of your up here, probably hmm, early August, start to taper. And then when your plant really looks like it's on its lag, last leg and you really want to extra water it or give it extra fertilizer, no, stop because it needs to concentrate. And that's when your top plant is kind of 
looking really, really bad, like the last <laughs> picture there. Uh, it's um, it's curing those potatoes so that they will um, give you potatoes that have a longer storage life by curing the skins underground. All right, why hill? Um, you don't have to. I mean, there's plenty of place, plenty of ways of doing it. Um, in a bag of potting soil, you cut a slit in it and don't do anything to it. Um, if you want a lot of tubers and you're doing it in either containers or in your garden beds. You'll get more potatoes. Um, they'll be more protected from the sun because now you're putting more dirt over them. And it's also weed prevention because you're moving that soil uh, up and around your plant. And it does create a water trough. So again, potatoes do not like to sit in water. So creating a water trough gives them the water they need, but it doesn't let, allow them to sit in too much water. So you're going to continue to hill up your um, plants until they flower, like I said. With fingerlings, this is a little bit different um, in that they love to be towards the top of your soil and they will gravitate up towards the top of your soil. Uh, this is good and bad. Uh, you do have to be vigilant and if you see them poking up to the top of the soil, either hill more, no matter what time it is, or uh, put straw pine needles locally, we have tons of them, or mulch, wood, wood chips, um, or if it's getting towards the end of the season, pick some and eat them because if they're coming up towards the top, that means that you've got quite a few down below and you can afford to pick some and eat them. Try them out. Okay, uh, more about hilling. Uh, this is just a little bit more examples of, of how they look when they're hilled. Um, this is outdoors and in a container in my yard. Um, those potatoes at the very top were planted in rows and then that's probably the first or second hilling. Um, you can see that you've got the trench on the sides and that's really good for runoff because they'll still get water, they just won't be sitting in it in or around the, the main stem. And then the bottom is in containers and that's almost towards the end uh, because they're almost towards the top of my container and I wouldn't be able to hill them anymore. So once you hit that, you're gonna just uh, let them go those ones haven't flowered, so they can do actually another hilling. It just pictures help. Mm. Another reason why we hill uh, solanine is that green stuff. And it's actually a, a glycoalkaloid that forms if potatoes are exposed to sunlight. It's mildly poisonous. It's not going to kill you. It's really not going to kill you. I, poisonous, anytime we say poisonous, people uh, worry. but um, it's not poisonous in, in that it's not going to hurt you. It might give you a bellyache if you ate the bottom right hand corner ones. Don't eat those. That's just, well, you wouldn't anyways. Uh, so this is why you need to hill up, um, covering the emerging stems and leaves until the plant flowers. Uh, so the ones up at the top right hand corner, right, left hand corner, um, those ones, those are actually not bad. That's Certainly not ideal, but you can cut those parts out. Um, fingerlings, again, grow towards the top. If they, you won't notice it as much on the colored ones like the fleur de bleu or the, the French fingerlings because the skins are red and blue. But um, on the banana, you will actually can see a little bit of greening. If it's not too much, cut it out. Uh, but best is to hill them up and make sure that the emerging potatoes are well covered and sheltered just so that they don't do this or come in contact with the sun. Uh, okay, <laughs> this is from last year because I did get quite a few um, people that said, I'm doing something wrong. And this is probably hmm, mid-August, early August. This is fine. This is what your potato is supposed to do. It's now gone into the stage where it's concentrating and going back down into your your potato spuds. So if it starts to look like this towards the end of the growing season, you are almost ready or you can just dig up your spuds. So this is what it's supposed to look like. And I don't worry. <laughs> okay, planting. Um, at the end, there will be a short demonstration of how to plant your potatoes. Very, very brief and very, very simple because essentially you're going to uh, choose an area either on your deck or out in your yard that has full sun, preferably south facing or with containers, chase the sun. 
totally works. It just takes a little bit more vigilance. Um, and then you're going to prepare your soil. We'll go into soil at the next couple slides, but um, with beds out, I, I like the idea and I use um, my normal shovel. So you want them, you want to plant them shovel deep and shovel wide and every, um, every 10 to 12 inches. And if you have a regular shovel, it's really easy to figure this out. So I just kind of dig a hole, pivot the shovel, dig a hole, pivot the shovel. Um, and that works really well for me. I've never had a problem with that. It's super easy to figure out. Um, and then you wanna cover your seed potatoes that you put out in those trenches. We're not talking about containers yet, but out in your trenches or your yard or your raised beds with a good three, uh, three to six inches of soil. It's surprisingly little amount of soil to put over initially, but if you remember, we're going to then hill them. So I pile the soil out to the sides. That way I don't have to dig soil and throw it over. It's already there and I can just go out quickly and kind of shovel some more, scoop some soil onto the sides of the plant as I go. Um, and then when we go to, uh, oh yes, and labor them. Really important because they will um, mature at different times. The fingerlings this year are pretty consistent in their maturity times, but you want to know what you're harvesting and when. The all-state abundance, as we mentioned earlier, uh, it will mature earlier. So you don't want to put a fingerling next to an all-state abundance because uh, you won't actually, <laughs> it might be, we want to know, and you don't want to dig up a plant too early and then have too few potatoes when you could have had a whole bunch. Um, so label them. And then in containers, just a little bit about containers. Um, I, uh, last year I went over all the abundance of different containers you can use, um, the, the felt bags that you can buy easily on Amazon or ask us for one of them. A recycled one um, are absolutely fantastic. They're black. They're dark. They they um, they drain really really well as long as you put them um, not directly onto soil or grass. That will retain some of the water in the bottom of them. But you can equally use. Um, I like kitty litter buckets that I have drilled a bunch of holes in the bottom and halfway up. Because if you think about how high you're going to hill them, that's a good 18 inches at least. So those work really well. And also when you dump them out at the end, it's easy, you don't make a mess and you know exactly where all your potatoes are. Um, I, if you're gonna use any other plastic container, um, it is a good idea to use one that is food grade. Um, easily obtainable from any grocery store, they usually throw them out, but you do not wanna use something that had contained paint or uh, anything toxic. So food grade plastic containers, and they're usually labeled as such. Um, I don't know what the, a specific symbol is, but uh, just make sure that they're food grade. Uh, all right. Ah, a bit about soil. We'll go into soil, fertilizers, etc. So soils, like I said, they like to wiggle around. They don't want to push. <laughs> uh, they want loamy, loose soil that's well drained but moist. They don't like huge flush fluctuations in wet drive. So just kind of they're easy, but they don't want to. They don't want to have to tell you that they are dehydrated. So well drained, but moist. So you do need to uh, evenly moist, but evenly water them. Um, they do like soil that is high in a well decomposed matter, and we'll tell you about all the options for you. So well decomposed, um, and then they do like slightly acidic soil. Again, back to why they grow well up here, because um, our soil, at least in the Tahoe area. Um, is is slightly acidic just at its at its baseline. So five to six is best. Five to seven is fine. Um, I will give you a link at the bottom. You can pay through uh, UC to have your soil tested. Um, it's not very expensive if you choose to do that or if you're worried about it or just curious. Um, and then Truckee soil is a little bit more uh, alkaline. So something to keep in mind. And there's another slide coming. Um, soil, potatoes actually need nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium and a little bit of calcium for different um, parts of their growing cycle. Um, so in doing some research this year and um, specifically on why some of the potato varieties did or didn't do as well, we found that the uh, New Orleans Reds 
did not do as well in the Truckee area. And that uh, I attributed to being slightly alkaline soil in that area. It's loamy, but it's very depleted and there's a clay component, which is, makes it a little bit more dense. So you wanna keep that in mind um, in terms of uh, choosing the amendments that you add to that soil. And so in 5B, 5, uh, 6B, and that's important if you are looking at what you're gonna grow alongside it. Um, Trekkie also has a little bit poor uh, water drainage. So you wanna make sure that you're adding some components that, that give those potatoes squiggle room and don't allow them to sit. And we'll go into what you can amend that with next. Then, then in uh, the lake, uh, you know, around the lake Meeks, Talek, area, we actually really do have some pretty well-drained soil. It actually can get too excessively drained. So water, uh, constant water or even watering is really important. And again, it is slightly acidic, which potatoes do love. Um, it's loamy and gravelly and sandy. So organic material is really important. And then I've listed just for fun, the zones around here, because they it's really varied. If you look at it, it's 5B to 7A. I'm sure there's like 10 other ones in there, but, and then uh, at the very bottom there, if you do want to get your um, your soil tested, oh, I said, it's you, it's UNR Cooperative Extension, and I've given you the phone number, and there is a small fee, it's not that much, so if you want, if you're interested, do that, I could, I highly recommend it. Uh, okay, soil amendments, so part of what we're doing is we really do want to know what grows around here. So it's kind of important that you use native soil. I'm not going to ding you if you don't, but um, would like you to use native soil. And that's just the stuff that's in your backyard or around your property or your so, so that you're adding that in so that you can have, you can see and tell us what does grow up here. Um, you probably will have to amend that with some potting soil. And I did have a question about that recently. And there's not a percentage, but I would go with like 50-50. So potting soil, native soil, um, or just go with native soil and see what happens and try again next year. But, um, and then again, um, adding the, the well decomposed organic material and that's in spring. So when you're preparing your beds and then fall so that you can prepare wherever you planted them for next year. Um, important, I'm not a huge poultry manure person or manure in general, um, but even if you're just using vegetable scraps or, or regular household compost, when you put it into the ground, it should not smell like what it is. So uh, that's kind of like the easiest way of describing it. If you if it smells like stinky chicken poop, um, it's probably not degraded enough. So you should wait or mix it uh, heavily with whatever else that you're using as a as an amendment. Um, pine needles are super easy. Uh, you can chop them up. You can throw them in. Potatoes actually love pine needles because they're good as a thatch or a mulch on top. And you can also work them into the soil, which they like because they like to squiggle around and have their room. So yeah, <laughs> uh, same thing with wood chips. Uh, wood chips are really good for protection like, like pine needles and they also loosen up the soil. Um, and good for uh, both, those two are really good for like we had snow. Uh, I threw a ton of pine needles and wood chips all over my beds, even though they hadn't been Hilled up yet, just to protect them, easily scraped off and easily amended into the soil for future healing. And then bone meal, bone meal. If you are worried about the, you know, the nutrient component of your native soil or even your whatever you're using as potting soil, if you reuse potting soil, uh, bone meal is a good source of nitrogen, phosphorus, and you, you do not need a lot. And if you, you can either add it at the beginning when you're preparing your beds or sprinkle it around to the side in your future hilling soil so that when you do dump that in, you've got a little bit of extra nitrogen and phosphorus. And we'll go over um, why those things are important in the next couple of slides. So soil amendments, they're like candy and shelter. <laughs> okay, fertilizers. This is um, not my area of expertise. And I think that um, Heather did in our first workshop go over extensively and she's really the expert. So if you have detailed questions, she's the one to ask. But in my experience, I really, really like the slow release fertilizers for potatoes specifically, and also for where we live. Um, that the slow release, they contain nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. The 
percentages I like is a 5, 10, 10, must be organic. And like Heather said, I do recommend that you look for that OMR on the label for, of your fertilizer. One of the reasons why I like slow release versus something that's just immediate is that um, you can dump them in or yeah, sprinkle them into your soil at the very beginning and then just walk away. You don't have to keep monitoring or keep adding, adding it throughout the season because again, it's slow release. And uh, it also then stays in the soil and doesn't wash into the ground or water table or lake, which is really important around here. Because it's slow release, it's kind of in the soil and not on the top of the soil. Um, because again, you've worked it into the soil. It also works with your natural native soil microbes. So it, the microbes then cause the slow release to release their nitrogen and it's also safe for worms for predominantly, especially if you look for one of the organic fertilizers that's marked as OMR. Um, my dad likes this. <laughs> uh, carbon sequestering. I'm not sure how that works, but every single slow release fertilizer um, does have a component or um, it does say that it keeps some of that carbon sequestered in your soil, which is always a good thing. So retains more biomass carbon. Uh, again, this is not my area of expertise, but I did make sure I was telling you correctly. Uh, nitrogen, why nitrogen? Why potassium, why phosphorus, why calcium? Nitrogen uh, is what is the key component in your foliage growth. So initially when your plant is growing, your potato plant's growing, you really want it to have huge foliage so that it gets all those nutrients and can channel it down at the appropriate time into your spuds. So uh, if you have too much foliage, it's later in the season, not so good because again, then it's just your plant is concentrating on leaves and not potatoes. So there is a balance. That's why we like the 5-10-10 because you're giving it just enough, enough nitrogen to get your plant going and then not too much to prevent potatoes. Uh, potassium is vital, vital for not only the uh, tuber, but also for the leaf. And that's, uh, it helps with your nutrient transport. So in your potatoes, in your potato plant above ground, it's going to help um, give nutrients up and down that stem back into your tubers, as well as um, protecting cell walls, specifically good up here, because it um, when we have frost or a cold snap or whatever, you won't have a potato plant that just can't survive it. So it's really, really good for cell wall protection. And it also stays in the soil and doesn't wash off or wash away, whereas um, nitrogen and phosphorus tend to. Um, phosphorus is important for yield. So high phosphorus in your, that's why you're 1010. Uh, if you have a, a good amount of phosphorus in your, in, in whatever fertilizer you use on your potatoes, you tend to have uh, larger and more potatoes because your potato plant is very, very happy. Uh, Tahoe area, the Tahoe area soil is actually kind of high in phosphorus. That's not great for the lake. So uh, if you have grown potatoes before and done fine, don't add phosphorus. Your soil is probably fine for that. But if you're finding if you've grown potatoes before and you just didn't not get it, you're getting a lot of foliage and no potatoes, it's usually a nitrogen or phosphorus imbalance. So it's something to watch out. And then calcium is not a huge component of potato crop um, growing, but it is important in protection from most specifically scab. So if you've ever grown potatoes, and I have pictures of them along the next slide probably, um, uh, calcium is really good for protecting the skin of potatoes from soil-borne diseases. So if you have had potatoes in the past or worried about that scab, um, a little bit of calcium is great to protect them. I save eggshells and crush them up and then I put them in my um, coffee grinder and make a powder and then throw them in the, the dirt, which is really easy and doesn't cost a thing. Ah, okay. <laughs> this is my silliness because I don't like to buy fertilizers. Um, and uh, so cool kid trip, easy, 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 easy. Um, and like we said in the last slide, potassium is a, is a pretty good component of, of fertilizers for potatoes and they do really like it because that's where you get your spuds. So if you have a large recycled jar, <laughs> water, banana peels, they don't have to be organic. They can just be regular banana peels. Uh, throw them in there. If you have bone meal on hand, it's totally optional. 
and then uh, water in the jar, put the lid on, leave it in a place where it won't get stinky or attract bugs, leave it for three days, and then you can dilute it and use that as fertilizer for your potato plants. And that can be done at the beginning, the middle, the end, it, it can't hurt your plants and it's kind of fun. As always, <clears throat> one of the things that's important to us is, um, while we're doing these workshops is to um, be conscious of our lake and what we're putting in it and what fertilizers or soil or amendments or any of our growing practices and how those will affect the lake. So I do want you to just take a minute and read over this slide. Um, and this is provided by um, Turk. So very important if you're gonna grow stuff around here, not only vegetables, but just in general. Okay, everybody got that? You can always reference it later. All right, last year, again, um, we got several comments wanting to know about some of the things, common pests, um, and I didn't address it as, as well as I probably should have, um, but I was, but this year with those purple huckleberries, those gophers that love Prince music and are Irish really um, only ate those. So some of the most common um, pests that you can um, look for, there are not a lot of them up here. So uh, don't be deterred. Go first, that's below your ground and they actually kind of love tubers and they're territorial. So even if you try and get rid of one, whatever means you do, uh, they usually have friends and they'll come back. The best way is to prevent them from getting into that area. And I like, using um, uh, fourth inch to half inch wire mesh in the bottoms of your beds or the area where you're going to plant them if you're planting them out the outdoors. You don't need to do that if you're doing it in containers because of course you can move your containers to get around and, and gophers get confused. So that's fine. <laughs> um, the other thing you can do if you don't have that mesh uh, is to plant uh, companion or repellent plants. They don't really like alums. So I usually plant chives or onions or garlic uh, around where I'm going to plant my potatoes and that's completely fine. Just remember you can't plant uh, an alums with peas. So that's an, a future workshop, but just you'll, you're, you're ahead of the game if you know that. So, and then <clears throat> I have found that the sound devices, those spikes that let off little ultrasonic or sound emitting things, I have never found that those work on anything and they can be quite expensive. So go ahead and try them, but they would not be something that I would recommend in my experience. Um, above ground, rabbits and squirrels. So we have tons of them. I think the rabbits are cute and I don't care if they eat all my stuff because they're so cute. They may annoy you. Um, the nightshade family, so that would include potatoes, tomatoes, eggplant, tobacco, and peppers. Um, the foliage is actually slightly poisonous. Again, poisonous, not going to kill them, but will give them a tummy ache. Most of them will try it or taste it, then then they won't like it, especially the older rabbits and squirrels, uh, and then they'll leave it alone. With, with tomatoes, that is a problem because if they eat part of the plant, it's not so great for above ground crops, but for potatoes, um, even if the rabbits or squirrels nibble and eat most of the plant, you're still gonna get a fair amount of tubers, especially late in the season. Um, so uh, not a huge problem, rabbits and squirrels. Um, squirrels will, <laughs> will dig up your new seed potatoes like they're having a party and throw them all over wherever your planting area is that's fine. Um, just replant them. Um, usually, once they once the, the seed potato sets roots, this, it's not as uh, exciting for squirrels to dig them up. But if they do, just just replant them. It'll be fine. Also, uh, again, rabbits and squirrels not really fans of chives. Rabbits will eat chives or alums later in the season as we get towards winter. But by then, you're usually out of the woods. And then um, under, I put this as under, so we got below, above, under, and I'm by under I mean under the leaves. Aphids is one of the things that we do have with potato plants. Um, so if you are watering your plants and you 
want to check under the leaves. Or if your plant is looking earlier in the season, not so spunky, kind of sad, do check under the leaves, especially in stressed plants. Um, say we had excessive frost, you went on vacation, didn't water them, was the aphids then see that as an opportunity. And what I do is just super simple. I just use my hose and I high spray, high power spray under the leaves or the whole plant just by holding it and spraying it. And that usually dislodges all of them. Um, but, and that is great if you don't have other plants that are susceptible. Um, potato plants, um, multiple other vegetable crops are more susceptible. So in that case, uh, if they're close to your potato plants, you want to probably use a diluted insecticidal soap and use that um, per the package instructions. Um, uh, and I usually dilute it as much as I possibly can just to not put that in my, in my food growing crops. But yes, if they're close, then you want to do that. And that usually takes, takes care of it. Um, another thing to look for if you're not sure if you have aphids is the leaves will look a little bit yellow and they'll get some the shiny spots. So that's a clear indication to, to inspect them a little bit further. Um, and then you can ladybugs, ladybugs love aphids and they're pretty. <laughs> uh, they don't stay very long, but they are readily available at most of your gardening um, areas and, and, and they're pretty. So if you don't want to, if you want to go any of those other routes, ladybugs um, are really good for potato plants. Oh, onto diseases. Only two major diseases in our area up here. So again, what, this is elevation gardening, so specific. There's a ton of potato diseases, but the two that you may come in contact with are blight, which is a fungus-like, um, it's an oomycete water mold. So it's not a true fungus, but fungus-like. Um, and what you'll look, what it looks like in your potato plants is usually into week, or sorry, into, into mid-season or late, you'll see that the, the foliage looks kind of brown and shriveled. Um, and you can do two things. Usually it's late in the season. So uh, what you can do is just cut and just discard as much of that foliage that looks like that. But make sure that you don't put that into your compost. You really do want to get rid of it, rid of it or burn it. Um, and just remember, and because your, your underground tubers will be fine, they're not really affected by blight above ground. That's really just the foliage. And then don't, and to prevent that, you want to rotate your crops and then you don't want to overwater them. Remember, evenly watering them, uh, that helps your plant be healthy so it can prevent itself from being um, susceptible to blight. Um, but also, uh, again, funguses like moist, moist leaves, moist plants. And then the other one is scab, like I mentioned before, it's really a bacterial, uh, it's predominantly cosmetic. Um, usually related to uh, high pH, so uh, uh, alkaline soil. So more, if, like we mentioned, trucky area is gonna have a little bit more problem possibly with this. Um, but if you're worried about that, then again, adding uh, a little bit of calcium. So in the form of I like ground up eggshells or any commercially calcium product will prevent that. It is purely cosmetic. Um, so even if your potatoes do have tons of scab, they're still edible. You just have to scrub them off, peel them, whatever. It is really just a cosmetic thing, but it does give you um, an idea about what, how your, the pH of your soil and something that you might want to address in future. Um, again, rotating, amending soil, cosmetic, not dangerous, peel, scrub skins. Uh, you can add sulfur, uh, eggshells or pine needles. Remember pine needles, we have tons of them. And this is just a chart, simple crop rotation. Um, I keep mentioning that potatoes really don't want to be planted in the same place for a variety of reasons, but this is the simplest, simplest crop rotation. And it also um, incorporates some of the things that we are growing or, give, or incorporating or using in our workshops this year. So potatoes and then tomatoes, and you're going to have some uh, peas and beans and then your lettuce kale shard. So if you follow this, not as important in containers, but if you're going to grow and raise beds or out in your garden in beds, super simple, really important, super simple. Okay, 
this is our let's get planting. So we'll, uh, next will be um, a very, very brief, very rudimentary um, planting um, example with some of the things that I use when I'm planting potatoes. So about pets. In a bed like this, I would, when I was preparing my bed, I would probably put in this, depending on how deep your bed is. And this is quarter inch, half inch, um, and nothing's gonna get through there or that can chew your spuds. And I would put that in the very bottom of my bed. And then depending on how high, this one, because it has the wood, you could, that's fine. If you have higher beds, long something at the bottom to deter them. Um, uh, the gophers are your underground critters that are gonna eat your stuff. I, if I have these in my beds, I've never had a problem with gophers. We figured out where we're gonna plant our potatoes and we have um, amended it and made sure that we have a nice little top. As I said earlier, or Dave said earlier, I like to go by um, shovel wide and shovel deep. So you can see that way I don't have to measure because I'm bad at that. Um, and then if you, I like this guy because I broke it off. So it's actually my own measuring device. So I go from there to there. So I'm gonna plant one here and I'm plant one there. And again, but there you go. So there, and we have some potatoes. Um, as Dave probably mentioned earlier, you can either plant potatoes whole or you can plant them cut. And you can see here. So that's your whole fingerling potato. You can see it has a couple eyes. These ones we just got today. So don't, they haven't quite developed all their sprouts yet, but you can see there's at least two. And so it's easiest thing ever. So you have your little hole here at the depth I said. You want to mound out so that you can scoop the dirt in eventually. And you're just going to put it in the bottom here. And then not even that much. It's basically like that. So again, cut side down because the shrouded parts are probably, or the eyes are going to probably be on this side. This is our stunt potato, so you can't really see it. And again, down in here and then fit making sure that you have dirt to hill up later. A few different types here. Um, these are the ones that felt bags easily. Get, you can get them online or uh, at your normal garden center. And I'm showing you about how much dirt because remember we're gonna, we're gonna hill and roll up. So if you see the level of dirt is probably, I don't know, two or three inches here. Um, and again, it's that nice, really, we squiggly dirt so your potatoes have, have room to squiggle around. And with containers, super easy. You're gonna take your potato and nestle it in here. It doesn't even matter that it's kind of close to the bottom and then add dirt around it. And two or three inches, this one, because I scooped them out so I could show you, and then I would add more. With the containers this size, I would probably put two or three at the most of your seed potatoes in here and then keep hilling up. And as you hill up, so pretend like I'm putting more dirt in here, you're gonna fold up, hill, fold up. And you're gonna cover all of the bottom leaves leaving just a little bit out. And then eventually you'll get to the top where you can't add any more potatoes. And probably at that point, it's like 18 inches and your potatoes are flowering. And that means they are concentrating, and this is all full of dirt, concentrating on growing the potatoes and you can a, don't hill anymore, and B, kind of taper off in your water. Remember, deep, even taper stop. Um, these are some of our examples of our potatoes that we're offering this year. That's a banana fingerling. And that's actually a pretty big one for a fingerling. Uh, it doesn't have any sprouts yet, but it's kind of pretty. So fleur de blue. So they're going to be very, very different in look, and you'll be able to easily identify them. That is going to be your, your French fingerling. And then the last one is the main crop, which is these ones. And that's actually the size that you're pretty much going to get. They're not going to be that much huge. They're not going to be huge. So it's totally fine. It's totally fine. These are small and creamy potatoes. Um, right. One more thing about potatoes, and I'm going to show you one more container. Uh, last year, we had some seed potatoes, and one of um, our gardeners said, uh, emailed me and said, can I still plant this? Um, and I and she showed me this, but it is disgusting. Okay, don't plant that. It's just not going to do well. So if you get a seed potato that looks like that, mm, throw it out. It's not good. 
because it's already starting to decompose and this guy is going to be susceptible to disease. So that's just an example of not a good CQ potato. If they do have a little bit of mold on them, that's fine. Just scrape it off, rub it off your hands, no biggie. But if they get where they're squishy and icky, that's not good. The other container that I really like, <laughs> uh, if you can't have a felt bag and you want to recycle stuff and you have cats, which I do and I love them. And if you take a drill and remember potatoes do not like sweet and sloppy wet soil. So a lot of holes, both in the bottom and the side, remember they're probably not gonna let grow any lower than this because you're gonna plant them at this level. Um, cat litter buckets, I spray paint in mine so it's prettier. Put, put your potatoes hill, hill, hill all the way up to the top. And the nice thing about container gardening with containers like this is they have a handle. <laughs> and then at the very end of the year, when your potato has all your plant has died back, you just dump it over and then you get, you know, where all the potatoes are. Okay. So we'll go back to slides about where to pick up our potatoes for this year. It should be next Saturday and some recipes, both skincare potato recipes and, um, absolutely fabulous potato salad. All right. Okay. Just for, for a little bit of fun, um, we're trying to include, um, some recipes, um, because of my background, um, I thought I would include two. So if you, if you want really beautiful skin, potatoes actually do have an application. Um, and these are, you can print these at your leisure, but um, potato skins or potatoes, you can blend them up and apply them to your face. I'll let you read that. And then the other one that I'm gonna include is a, a recipe for my absolutely favorite potato salad, which is um, um, vegan for the most part. Um, uh, which surprises some of my friends. If, you, if you've ever made mashed potatoes and blend, blended them way too much, they get that sticky, goopy, yucky, which is actually beneficial in vegan potato salad because it mimics mayonnaise. So if you are making this potato salad and you take a couple of your cooked potatoes and then blend the ever-loving crap out of them and then add them back into this recipe, you have actually a really, really creamy vegan potato salad. And this is my recipe for that. Uh, yeah, then, um, a bit of silliness, uh, but um, we do actually really, really want your feedback. Um, all of our presentations come with contact information so that you can share pictures, um, share questions, share what happens at the end of the season and also along the way. And we do quite frequently use your pictures and your experiences in, in our data collection and presentations. At the bottom of the slide, you can you see my contact information, which is um, Tahoe uh, Tater Talk at gmail.com. And you are absolutely welcome to contact me at any time and ask me any questions and I will get back to you as soon as possible. Oh yeah, have to put that in there. We need more cat pictures, so yeah. That's my cat, that's Jack. He says he wants potatoes, so you need to grow them. <laughs> to the left of the slide is what we have in addition to potatoes this year, um, in case you're interested. So sign up and at the very bottom there is where you would register to sign up for those other workshops. Okay. The first question is, last year I had an abundance of grape-sized potatoes at the end of the season. What could I try this year? I'm assuming to yield larger potatoes. Ah, okay. Um, so uh, they're just, <laughs> did you get any bigger potatoes would be my, my oh, oh, and whether those ones were just the ones that came to the top. Um, I think potassium and phosphorus are probably your problems because that goes back to yield not a nitrogen uh, deficiency it's more in the realm of a potassium um, phosphorus deficiency so just be mindful of whatever you're mending with um last year we did have uh, quite a few uh really small potatoes um and i'm not entirely sure why um but um yeah uh, i would try amending with a little bit more potassium or, or phosphorus not nitrogen because that's leafy the only time or the only place I can plant is my raised beds due to pests. This soil is amended and not native. I assume I can still plant potatoes, right? Oh gosh, yeah. But I would also go out into the yard. Um, I'm sure you can find some native soil and add it into there um, because then you can test out how well your potatoes grow, at least with um, a part of, of native soil. Um, but if you don't want to, no biggie. Yes, you can absolutely do that.
If we have potatoes left over from last year, can we use them as seed potatoes this year? Yep, sure, absolutely. In fact, I um, uh, routinely, if I have too many of them, will stuff them away in the back of the refrigerator in a paper bag and pretend like they're not there. And then um, when it gets the, the ground gets above 45 degrees, I will drag them out and leave them on the counter in their paper bags so they don't get sunlight on them and plant them because, uh, and then they will usually go. Normally, if you put them in the refrigerator, I know it's a, it's a, it's kind of a, a myth. People don't want to put their potatoes in the refrigerator. I always store my potatoes in the refrigerator because they last a whole ton longer and, um, and uh, they don't sprout as quickly because they're, they don't, they, they're cold. They don't want to sprout. They don't think they're supposed to grow. So yeah, absolutely. I put my, my leftover potatoes in the, in the refrigerator and then I will replant them. In fact, I probably have some in there now. Awesome. Next question. Where can we get seed potatoes in Truckee other than the fingerlings you all are giving away? Uh, it's a tough thing because, because of the pandemic, the uh, supply of seed potatoes has been really cutthroat. Um, I'm not, I'm serious. Like you would, it's like cutthroat. We went to get our potatoes, um, was, was a battle and getting our order in like before everyone else. Um, if you don't, so it, most of your, I know Nell's in South shore has them usually, but they go very, very quickly. You can order them on Amazon. Um, but we all, I will remind that we do have the, the variety of the, um, the upstate abundance. So it's not all fingerlings. I'm with you. Sometimes the fingerlings are not that great, but they're pretty and they grow really well and you'll get a lot of them, but we all, we do um, have the upstate abundance. So. Can you please explain a little more of the difference between deep and even watering? Okay. So um, you deep watering is only when you're first planting your potatoes. Essentially, your seed potato has all of its nutrients and, and a fair amount of water that it needs. Um, you do want to get it into a nice little safe, nicely moist soil to begin with. And then even watering means that you don't want to saturate the soil. The soil should never, never be like where you get a handful of soil and you squeeze it and it drips. That's, potatoes do not like that. They want evenly moist soil. So kind of crumbly, but it's not dry or blows away. That, that kind of um, crumbly soil, but not wet at all. So that's even. And then towards the end, once it flowers, you can kind of taper back where you're, where you might have been watering um, uh, containers, you know, every two days. Then you're going to go to like every four days to where you actually see the soil be kind of dry ish. Um, so uh, deep at the beginning is the only time you're ever watering potatoes, um, ex you know, a lot. And then it's just kind of even. Me and even meaning don't up here in Tahoe, don't water your potatoes and then go on vacation for five days and expect that your potatoes are gonna be happy. That's not even. Awesome. Do you put chicken wire in the bottom of bag containers? Also, do the bags have natural drainage or do you need to poke holes? No, you do not need to poke holes. You do not need to put um, any my wire in the bags. The bags are fine. Uh, if the best thing with bags, if you're worried about gophers, they're not usually going to bother coming through the ground and digging into your bag. Um, and the easiest way, if you're worried about that, is just to move your bags around because the, the, they're not going to bother. You don't need to put chicken wire in your bags. The bags actually naturally drain. They drain very, very easily. Um, so they're good in, the, in terms of that. Great. And then a couple people had put in the chat locations that they had found seed potatoes in the area. <laughs> um, Christina Francis was saying Home Depot, um, as well as the villager in Truckee, but they go quickly. Um, so get them <laughs> quickly. Um, and then others are asking if there are is still the potential to register for potatoes with this workshop. And the answer is yes, you can still register. You would go through and re-register the same way um, that you registered for this uh, to get the workshop link um, from on the Slow Food Lake Tahoe website. And we'll be sending that out and I'll put it up on the screen here in a little bit once we get through our question and answer period. But you are still able to, we have a few, I think there were maybe 30 
um, bags left of potato, uh, seed potatoes. So yes, yeah. you can still and get those fingerling potatoes. And Melissa, could you just briefly mention again, the three varieties, or maybe it's more than three varieties oh, sure. of fingerling and, potatoes and that will be available? And also you have the link at the end of the presentation. Uh, at the end, we, we usually have extra potatoes. So feel free to, if you can't find them elsewhere at some of the garden centers, because they do go quickly. Um, you always try, because we always have some extra at the end. The varieties that we have this year are three different fingerling potatoes. So they're red, white, and blue. The banana, the um, French fingerling, which is red, and then the fleur de bleu which is blue and blue inside. So very pretty. And it actually tastes better than the Peruvian purple. And then we have as a main crop, which is the regular, you know, regular round, yummy potato. That one is the, um, the upstate abundance. And that's the one that's super creamy that was developed at Cornell. And what was the tool you used for harvesting? And what was the worst thing to do when harvesting in a bed that you were uh, shaking earlier? The video cut out a little bit. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. The tool, the tools that I have are broken handled tools. So, um, so the tool that I like to harvest is like a, is a pronged, it's like a four pronged hoer. I, I don't even know what it's called. Um, what is it? Hay fork? Ooh. Yeah, it's kind of like, it looks like a curved hay fork. And so it has little different prongs. And um, the nice part about it is you can just kind of comb through the dirt versus stabbing the dirt. And the thing that I don't want you to do is use a shovel to just kind of like aggressively go in there and dig because you, you'll, you'll, you'll cut into your potatoes. Now, if you do that, that's totally fine. Just you got to When you find those potatoes that you've now eviscerated, you need to eat those that day uh, because they, you know, they, they, they need to be eaten. You've killed them. Just eat them. Um, when sliced potatoes are planted is skin side up or down. Oh, sli uh, the slice should be down. So when you're when you're cutting your potatoes, you want to cut them in a manner that the that the sprouty bits or the eyes are uh, on the not cut side. Ah, I don't know how to explain that. Yeah, cut side down. <laughs> the sprouty bits go up. They want to go up. Don't make it harder on your seed potato. Oh yeah. Well, that after you harden it all, after you harden cut side. All right. Does it matter if bananas are organic or not for the cool kid trick you shared? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. I, 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 want, I would imagine that organic bananas and normal bananas have the same amount of nutrients that will dis, you know, disperse into your, uh, your homegrown uh, jar fertilizer as, uh, yeah, I would think that you're, you're fine either way. Yeah, go with, go with cheap banana skins. Awesome. And then what makes something a seed potato? Can you just plant potatoes you buy at the grocery store? Oh, seed potatoes are actually um, specific in that they are um, genetically identical. They are uh, organic. They are pesticide free and they are grown specifically all the way to maturity. So they're not, even if they're little, they are mature potatoes that are left in the ground. And then usually they are grown in ground that they do not grow potatoes in again so they're kind of like the purest potatoes and um seed potatoes are you can you i mean if you get them at the grocery store i think that's one of the slides europe they used to be in the grocery store they used to spray them with um, an anti-spray uh, anti-sprout chemical and i can't remember the name it starts with a c um but now that is really really minimal so uh, in europe it's been banned forever um so that the, you can technically grow potatoes from um, the grocery store if they sprout. Just remember that you're probably not gonna get a huge yield because there's probably an element of that anti-sprouting um, stuff on them. And also they are sometimes not grown to maturity and seed potatoes are actually grown to maturity intentionally. Um, and they are that variety versus um, some of the ones that are in the grocery store, but hey, uh, I'm in favor of trying anything. I'm a huge experimentalist with things that I buy from the grocery store just to see what will happen. So knock yourself out. Great. And would it be beneficial to add some shredded pine needles and cones into my soil? Yeah, Whether yeah. At this location or anywhere generally? I, you know, I, I've never tried um, doing pine cones. Um, because of the resin. And I think the resin that um, exudes from dried pine cones might be a problem. 
um, and it's there is some resin in pine needles, but it's really really minimal. I I uh, always always incorporate pine needles, crunched up pine needles in my potato beds always. And remember, our potatoes like to squiggle around, so that gives them a little. The pine needles give them a little extra wiggle room. Um, what is the brand of slow release, fer slow release fertilizer you recommend? I, I don't ever recommend any brands um, uh, just because I'm, I'm not an infomercial. But um, I do. <laughs> if you look for a slow release that has the 51010, I, I would think that any brand would work. I just I don't choose to, to, um, to promote any particular brand. Gotcha. And uh, what season is the best to plant potatoes? Well, it depends on where you live. So if you live here now, now. Um, it, so I, I'm being glib. Um, as soon as the as the soil wherever you're going to plant it reaches about 45 degrees, um, so and also after you know that there's not going to be really hard frosts, um, potatoes are fairly tolerant. Even if it's if even if it snows, they they'll survive. They just they, they would prefer to be planted in ground that is about you know above 40 45 degrees. Which, if you amend it and, and you know dig around, it's going to be especially now. And if it does snow, you just cover them; they'll survive. They're easy. You know, potatoes are resilient; they're not fussy. Awesome. And the last question that we'll end on is: Can you harvest from the seeds of the flowering plant? So we will actually, in, in probably next year, I'm going to do. I'm going to evolve all of you into seed potato planting, true potato planting. So yes, you can. Um, I have that in the works right now. I don't know if we have a long enough season to actually grow them from seeds, um, but I, I do plan on um, experimenting with that and reporting back. I will screen share our pickup locations. Um, so if you have any additional questions, there were a lot of questions that we weren't able to get to in our time um, tonight, but if you have any follow up questions, uh, you can email Melissa at the Tahoe Tater Talk at gmail.com email address and she is so excited about potatoes that she's more than happy to answer any and all questions that come her way. And then those three pickup locations for this weekend are in South Lake Tahoe and Truckee and in Tahoe City. And those are the three locations that we are running this year based on our capacity. Um, we've definitely learned a lot this evening and look forward to our future workshops in the coming weeks. But if anyone has any last minute questions that they want to share in the chat with us um, that we can help get addressed if anyone is interested in still registering, I'll stick around for a bit to help answer some of those questions. But thank you all so much for joining us and we hope you have a great evening.